What we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History Chapter 11, Mediterranean Society, the Roman Phase. As always, here's our uh, pre-video kind of information session. To be able to successfully follow along with each video lecture, students will read the chapter two times, once before and after the lecture. Some of you have not been doing super well on these tests. I would like to remind you that this is a college-level AP course. It's supposed to mimic or at least come close to what is expected in a college-level world history course. If you're not reading, you are not preparing yourself to be successful on these tests. And I guarantee one thing, if you don't read, you will not do well on these AP exams. So make sure you're reading. Cornell notes will be required for each flipped lecture. I've been going around stamping, circling your notes. Make sure you have those for this lecture. These notes will be due on the data signing class, probably tomorrow. At the end of each lecture, students will be required to prepare other work for the class that is assigned at the end of the video. Make sure you have that separate sheet of paper. Questions or concerns about the lecture should be sent via email if urgent or written on your Cornell notes for discussion the next day. Introduction. This chapter traces the growth and development of Rome from its humble beginnings on the banks of the Tiber River through its republican phase and its transformation into a sprawling cosmopolitan empire encompassing much of Europe and Northern Africa. A tight administrative structure and organized trade network promoted the movement of people, goods, and ideas throughout the empire. The Romans had a significant impact on later Mediterranean, European, and Southwest Asian cultures. These influences include, but are not limited to, the following. First, the concept of a republican form of government governed by a constitution and a fixed body of law that guaranteed the rights of citizens. Second, an elaborate transportation and communications network with sophisticated roads, sea lanes, linking port cities, and an imperial post system. Third, economically specialized regions, either in the development of cash crops for export or in localized industries. And finally, new cities built throughout the empire with unprecedented levels of sanitation, comfort, and entertainment opportunities. The Romans also contributed to the widespread dissemination of philosophical beliefs and values like Stoicism and religions of salvation like Christianity. All right, before we begin, I'd like to talk about uh, like the four probable phases of Rome. Many people will talk about the three main phases of Western Rome, and then they're going to talk about the transition to the Byzantine Empire. I would like to argue that uh, the Byzantine Empire is just an extension of what the Romans understood themselves to be, so we'll, we'll look at that a little later uh, in other chapters, but first, today, I want to talk about just these first three. Uh, the first phase of Rome was under the Etruscans, which would be known as the Kingdom. There are seven hills in Rome, and there were seven original kings of Rome, uh, the first one being Romulus, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. After the Kingdom set up, uh, the people of Rome basically overthrow the last king of Rome and uh, establish a republic with a senate and some consuls, two to be exact. And then when Julius Caesar arrives on the scene, we're going to get to the Empire, and his son, uh, his adopted son, Octavian, or Augustus, will actually kind of uh, change the way that the whole of Rome operates all the way until its eventual fall. So the establishment of Rome, unlike other cultures that we've studied, Rome has a very specific date on which it was uh, founded. By most sources we have, it was probably April 21st, 753 BCE. Uh, it's a very specific date because the Romans spent a lot of time trying to figure out when exactly they were founded, especially the later Romans, and uh, they came up with just this date. This is the date they just decided, and it all comes back from the story of the legend of Romulus and Remus. Now, uh, the story of Romulus and Remus basically boils down to this. There were two brothers who were left by the side of the Tiber River. One was named Romulus, one was named Remus, and they were left there for basically the reason that a prophecy had said that they were going to grow up and overthrow one of their close relatives who was like the king of the area. Now to prevent this, uh, the king had sent uh, his servants with the babes to go and tell them to drown them in the river, and the servants had felt pity on the babes, so they left him by the river. Well, instead of dying of like exposure or falling into the river, along comes this like she-wolf that allows the babes to suckle on her um, mother parts, and basically raises them as her own pups. And eventually the boys grow up, they overthrow their relative, and they basically establish like a kingdom until one day uh, the two brothers are in a field right by the Tiber River, and Romulus actually kills his brother Remus, and on that spot he founds Rome. And uh, if you look at kind of the entomology of the name Romulus, 
it's Latin basically translates to the the little son from Rome or the little boy of Rome and so that's how Rome was founded obviously this is a legend there probably wasn't a couple babes that were nursing on a on a wolf that just happened to wander by but it's a kind of a cool story that kind of links up the Romans with the belief that uh, for a lot of them they saw themselves as number one just being like the sons of beasts like very strong and like able to survive anything and they were conquerors and number two it kind of points to Rome's like kind of history of being kind of a chaotic place where one brother kills another and it's just kind of bloody and in, in like there's just a lot of family problems and drama and so the Romans were kind of proud of their story like that for us historians we know that Indo-European migrants probably showed up there around 2000 BCE, setting up in the area. They found bronze in the area probably about 1800 BCE, and they started using iron in the area about 900 BCE. And so that's when like the basic foundations of Rome are getting established. First up, we have the Etruscans, who were the first leaders of Rome. They originally are from like Anatolia. <clears throat> I'd like you to think about Turkey or like Asia Minor. That's where Anatolia was. They colonized the Po River Valley to the Naples region. And this is basically all of the middle of like Italy and covers most of Rome. Their society is going to decline late 6th century BCE for two reasons. Basically, Greek maritime attacks. The Greeks get in boats, travel over to the port cities of like the Roman areas, start attacking their port cities, causing a lot of damage and loss of property. And there's also some Celtic or Celtic invasions from the north, specifically Gaul, which is also known as France. So uh, this is going to cause some problems for the Etruscans. Now the first phase of Rome was the Kingdom of Rome. There are seven hills of Rome, like I said. There were seven original kings, and it was through the 7th to the 6th century BCE that Rome uh, basically had these kings. The first king we know was Romulus. And then there's some just like kind of random names and a little bit of disagreement on who actually was like kings after him it's all written down in those old latin books but for our purposes we just need to know that our, the original foundation of rome was set up as a monarchy with a king now under these etruscan kings there were streets that were built like paved roads not just dirt roads there were temples to god set up and there were public buildings this is uh, a sign of as we talked about in our first chapter uh, the sign of civilization and cities being set up and when I use the word civilization, you got to remember that we're using it in the term of like setting up cities, not so much in terms of judging them. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, look at Rome as a major center of trade routes. If you think about it, it's got a large river, the Tiber, right next to us. It's on a peninsula, which is Italy. It's right in the middle of the Mediterranean, where a lot of this trade is going on. And it's, it's part of just this larger system of trade routes. And next up, we have the establishment of the Republic. 509 BCE, the Romans overthrow the last Etruscan king, and the Romans decide we don't want to have any kings. The Romans were very proud of their heritage as being people who got rid of the kings, and they build this Roman forum. There's a picture of like the ruins of it just here on the left, and the forum was the place where the Senate would meet. Now, the Senate was this radical new way of understanding how you should govern people. The Romans had set up what is known as a Republican Constitution. Now, when I say Republican, I'm not talking about the American version with, like, Republicans and the grand old party. But I'm talking about a Republican Constitution where it's dealing with a republic. Now, in America, many people say we're a democracy. We're not a democracy. We're a republic. Now, when we looked at the Greek uh, understanding of government, the Greeks believed wholly in democracy. Every person is equal in value and should have the right to voice their opinion in the public arena as long as you're a male and as long as you own property but that was a very radical idea that everyone had value just because of their personhood now the republic model actually is a little different because the romans believed that democracy was good but that if you allow too many people to actually have a voice it's kind of like letting a mob rule now imagine if every day in my classroom we were to decide what we were going to do so I had you all vote and let's say I gave the first thing so today we're going to vote on homework how many of you raise your hand think we should have homework well some of you would say no we shouldn't have homework because homework's boring and then some of you wouldn't would raise your hand saying yes we need homework we need the points we're dying out here our grades are low well it would really just come down to whoever had the most people on their side at the time 
and they would just dominate the other groups of people. Now that works well in like non-life or death situations, but when you think about like really big ideas or really important decisions, allowing a mob to just kind of rule over your classroom or rule over your society would be terrible. You could take away rights from people you just don't like. Like imagine, for example, if there was pure democracy, people could just vote and say that that group over there, well, they don't get to be citizens anymore, or that group over there, they don't get to have anything anymore. We took it all away from them because we voted. So the Republic was this idea that there is a set of ideas or a set of laws and rights that can never be taken away from people. That once you're a citizen, you are bound to have some sort of right. And by having those rights, you are guaranteed certain things like right to a trial. And that no matter how much people voted, they could never take away these things. This is a radical departure from our understanding of how laws work. Now, under this Republican Constitution, there was an executive branch, and this executive branch had two consuls. Think of them like the presidents of the Republic. It's not the same as the president we have, but it's close enough that these two consuls were seen as like the, the leaders of the country. The reason there were two is a, there's a couple reasons. Number one, the, the two consuls were only given one-year terms because they believed that you couldn't really screw up the country super bad in about a year, and you could always get rid of them naturally by having their terms expire. You could always re-elect them, but they had to wait 10 years before they could be re-elected re anyways. So that would kind of keep people from having like too much power at one time. They also believed they should have two of them because one could check the other one in terms of power and balance. And you could have a difference of opinion, and that would still work out as long as people like did what was best for the country. And then finally, they believe they should have two consuls because Rome kind of had it in its early days that we have to go out, we have to conquer, we have to like ride out with our armies and take stuff. And if our leader is out there riding with the armies, well, then we need to have another guy back home like collecting taxes and making sure everything's working right. Now, the main focus for the Republic was the Senate. The Senate was this group of elected officials who were chosen by the people and pretty much were probably the smartest or the most landed which means they had the most money or they were seen as people of valuable influence within the community so for example uh, in a democracy you could just elect like the most popular guy like if we took like a vote in America of who should probably be like our next president and it was like pure democracy I'm pretty sure we'd have President Wiz Khalifa so we need to make sure that in like Rome, for example, we don't have President Wiz Khalifa or Consul Wiz Khalifa, uh, co-consul Kanye West, but <clears throat> in it we have a Senate that is elected by the people, and they're the smartest amongst the people, or at least the most like skin in the game kind of people. And as a result of that, the Senate will make decisions for us, so we don't have to go vote every day, and they're going to make the best decisions for us with the hope that. It would all work out in the end because those people have the most to lose if they make bad laws. This is going to come back a little bit later to bite some of the peoples in the butt. Next up we have social conflict. Uh, the patricians or the aristocrats are starting to come into conflict with the plebeians and this is going to last throughout most of Rome. Now the patricians or the aristocrats were landed. They had lots of money. They had a, a heritage of having a lot of influence within Rome. And then there were the plebeians. These are people just like merchants and people of maybe status. Maybe they had a few shops in the area, i.e. the merchants. Or maybe these were just random people that represented a small group of people in Rome. Well, they're going to start to complain because the plebeians or the commoners are going to say, hey, every time there's some sort of law or decision to be made, the senators always decide to pick the law or a way to right things so that they make more money and we get screwed. So there's this major class conflict that happens in the 5th century BCE, and the plebeians, the compromise is reached that the plebeians should be allowed to elect tribunes for representation. So amongst the citizen assemblies of all adult male citizens, so everybody who's an adult male, they decide to say, okay, there are 300 senators who we're going to have, and we're going to mix them in with some plebeians, and then we're going to have some tribunes. We're going to have an equal amount of voice to the senators, and they're going to try and like help to elect consuls and help to like pass laws and things. And these rights are going to get expanded through the 3rd century BCE, and this constitution allowed for dictators to be appointed in times of crisis. Now you see, the dictator was decided to be put in place because, let's say Rome is attacked, and there's not really a clear consensus on who should actually be in charge. 
well, the Senate could just elect a guy to be in charge of the army, and he could ride out and try and fix things. He could only be a, a dictator for six months, and he could try and fix everything six months, and then they would take away all of his power. Uh, this also was a good idea because Rome has a very long history of dudes from within getting too high up on their horse and deciding, hey, maybe I should be in charge of Rome. And you know how I'm going to do that? Get a bunch of guys to follow me and fight the other people in Rome. So having a dictator who can just kind of show up and keep the rebellions down is a good plan. Next up, there's an expansion of the Republic. These uh, Romans actually dominate the Etruscans. They get rid of a majority of them. And the Romans take over the iron industry in the 5th to 4th century BCE. This is going to give them a lot of like technology to make better tools and to make better weapons. They're able to basically expand their borders in one of two ways, military threat and incentives. We've heard it before with military threat. Basically it goes like this. Guy shows up, I'm an envoy from Rome, y'all in this village better understand that if you do not surrender under, uh, unto Rome, all of your stuff and you just basically commit to being one of our uh, cities as part of our empire we're going to show up with the biggest baddest dudes you've ever seen they're going to kill all of you they're going to take your sons and daughters as slaves and they're going to like hurt your women right and burn everything to the ground so why don't you just give up now and in addition to the military threat they said as long as you don't fight us and you don't come out and try and stop us what we'll do is instead give you some incentives now the incentives work like this. First off, they were giving them tax exemptions. So let's say you were the small town of Pepsi. That's what's near me right now. The small town of Pepsi has been visited by the Roman envoy. And the Roman envoy says, look, don't, don't fight us, and here's what we're going to do. All your high-level people, well, they're going to be given citizenship. They're going to become members of the Roman uh, spirit state and what that means is they get certain rights that can never be taken away from them and all their kids will eventually have citizenship that's going to make things really easy for you if you're like the leader of a country you get a lot of respect you're also going to get some tax exemptions all the people don't have to pay taxes anymore to like just random taxes but they do have to you know put up a little bit of like tribute every now and then by sending some soldiers and some other good stuff to rome and they got to listen to whatever rome says and finally they give them trade privileges they tell them, look, you guys are like at Pepsi, I don't know, you guys make the best pots, I guess. And by being the best pot makers, what we're going to do is allow you to come into Rome, into our marketplaces, and sell them. And we're not going to tax you guys like super hard, and you'll be have the, allowed to have the freedom to sell within our borders. Doesn't that sound awesome? If you make pots and you were only able to sell it to a small area of the world, well now you can go into Rome and you can sell to the entire known world at that point. And you're going to make a ton of money, which is going to be awesome. Next up is the most major event, I would say, in the years of the Republic, the Punic Wars. Now, Romans, for a very long time, are having this conflict with Carthage. From 264 to 146 BCE, the little tiny country of Carthage has been basically plaguing all of Rome. Sicily is full of wheat, or grain, basically, and uh, there were three major wars known as the Punic Wars that were between Carthage and Rome, and they were all trying to get to that little island. If Italy looks like a boot, Sicily's the little thing that's being kicked that looks kind of like a cheese pizza. This later conflict with the declining Hellenistic Empire starts to happen. They basically dominate the Carthaginians. They wipe it off the map. Carthage, for a very long time, was destroyed to the point where we basically didn't know where it was. We found it pretty recently in, through archaeology. But the Romans were very good at like stomping over stuff and like salting the earth and everything and cursing the land. This conflict with the later declining Hellenistic empires, all is basically uh, Rome fighting with the, the leftover uh, kingdoms from Alexander's generals. Remember how Alexander, when he died, gave all his generals uh, an equal piece of land? Well, the Ptolemies, for example, in like Egypt, they're kind of declining, and Rome is starting to have this conflict with them. But the, the former Alexandrian generals' kingdoms, they're not really doing so well, so Rome starts to expand into their area. And by the middle of the second century, Rome is dominating the Mediterranean. All that like white stuff on my map is pretty much what is owned by Rome, or at least controlled by Rome, especially the waters within the Mediterranean. This is a fun little side note. This is Cato, one of my favorite people. He was a great orator during uh, the battles of the Punic Wars, and one of his favorite things to do was to give speeches. And at the end of every speech, he would say, furthermore, I believe Carthage should be destroyed. So, for example, he'd say, I would like another uh, 
couple grapes over here, and furthermore, Carthage should be destroyed. Or he'd give a speech in front of the Senate and say, that is why I think we should raise the taxes on grain. And furthermore, I believe Carthage should be destroyed. Kind of a fun dude, also kind of a weird dude, but interesting side note. There's imperial expansion and domestic problems. This land distribution starts to show up. There is a perennial problem with distributing land amongst the people. There are de there's this development of large plantations known as latifundia, or plantations slash like large estates. The latifundia are owned by aristocratic families, some of them well-connected within the Senate, who have gotten laws and different land grants and taxes passed in their favor so they can expand their power and their money through land. Well, if you know anything about plantations, they're usually large tracts of lands that grow like weed or different things. And if you're a small farmer nearby, you're not going to be able really to compete in the marketplaces with someone who can make a lot of grain or a lot of grapes or whatever. And you're going to have to sell your prices even cheaper. And if you get to a certain point where you don't make any money, you're going to have to go and sell your land to those latifundia, making their monies even bigger. And that's not really cool. So there's going to be this like problem between how do we figure out how to keep the rich from getting richer and how to keep the poor from getting poor? How do we find a way to like balance everything out? We're having this huge issue. Those aristocrats are really screwing over the poor guys. Here's a uh, map of the expansion of the Roman Republic up till 146 BCE. You can see, look at how far Rome has spread from where Rome is in the middle of Italy. It spread all the way over to Anatolia, which is like Asia Minor slash modern day Turkey. And it's conquered most of Greece. It's got where Carthage used to sit on the horn of on the tip of Africa, excuse me, and then almost all of Spain is owned by uh, the Romans, and this is going to show up a little later on their trade networks within their empire. But uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and look at that map in a little bit. Well, back to that whole idea of like the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. We get to the Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius, or Gaius, attempted to limit land holdings of aristocrats. They were some of the first people kind of really working to try and figure out how do we keep people from getting too powerful. So they decide to uh, find a way to say, okay, if you have so much land, if you gain any more than a certain amount of land, we're going to take that land that you gained fr from you and we're going to redistribute it to poor people. This was an attempt to say, yeah, you guys can get rich, but you shouldn't get like super rich. Well, the aristocrats they start to get really pissed off about this whole process because they see it as a threat to their money and when you're messing with my money you're messing with my emotions and so Tiberius is assassinated and Gaius is executed on some trumped up charges they basically make up some crime he did and then they kill him uh, through this process there's a development of private armies made of landless peasants if you were one of those people that had to sell your land to the Latifundia owners because you were getting screwed in the marketplace well, you're going to probably join the Grocky brothers because what they're saying is, hey, if you help us and you help get us elected, what we're going to do is we're going to, like, go and fix everything. We'll give you back your land and we'll, like, break up this whole, like, giant plantation system. So that sounds pretty good. Well, about 40 years later, a guy named Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla show up and they start having a similar battle between what the aristocrats had with the Grocky brothers. Uh, now... Gaius Marius takes Rome in 87 BCE, uh, and he starts to make some reforms, but then Sulla drives Marius out about 83 uh, BCE. Now, Sulla is on the side of the aristocrats, and he is really going to town on the people of Rome and the country of Rome. He has this reign of terror that follows. We know that it's probably, in our best estimates, about 10,000 people died under this reign of terror, and at one point, Sulla even used to just publish lists of people that he didn't like, and he would give full permission as uh, as like the ruler of the republic that what they could do is just if you saw that guy on the list in the street, you could kill him, take his stuff, and then Sulla would make sure that you got his land. So this made it super crazy, super dangerous. Nobody could trust anybody. It's going to cause like a civil war during this time. Well, there at the same time... Uh, a little bit younger probably in his late teens there's a guy named Julius Caesar running around he's a nephew of Marius he understands what it's like to be on the side of like the peasants and to be on the side of kind of the people who are losing their land but he escapes Sulla's terror he's like 17 probably late early 20s late teens uh, relatively young he takes a well-timed trip abroad basically goes to like the Greek islands and when he comes back he starts to rise in popularity number one he's not killed by Sulla because uh, they don't really see him as a threat at the time plus he was a, he wasn't around 
And this rise in popularity comes from because he gives public spectacles. He's spending out of pocket for gladi gladiator games and for great events and buying people wine, and he's just making everybody love him. And he's also a really good general. He has these victories in Gaul, which is like modern day France. And basically people get him elected and uh, he, de he decides that Rome isn't really in a great place. So in 49 BCE, Julius Caesar decides to take all of his armies, who were now loyal just to him, not to the country of Rome, and to take them into Rome and attack Rome and try and install himself as the consul. Uh, there's this saying that goes along with Caesar that he says the die is cast. So in the future, when you hear somebody say the die is cast, it's kind of like somebody saying, like, I'm letting everything fall it may, where it's supposed to be. Uh, this is just the way things are going to be. And so when you hear somebody say die is cast, I want you to keep that in mind. And there's another thing that's associated with Caesar during this time. It's called crossing the Rubicon. Crossing the Rubicon is like a, a euphemism for saying I can't turn back now or I've crossed the point of no return. The Rubicon used to be this really tiny river in like the northern part of Italy that no one was allowed to take their armies past. When you came back from your great victories out in the provinces or wherever that you were supposed to be fighting all the barbarians that the Romans didn't like, you were supposed to give up all your all your soldiers' uh, weapons and store them away in like these great barracks and stuff, and then you could march into Rome and party and stuff. But Julius Caesar doesn't do that, making himself a traitor to Rome. Well, in 46, he wins and names himself dictator for life radical radical change from the constitution of the republic now with caesar naming himself dictator he for life he's breaking that six month code also he's kind of eliminating the offices of the consuls those two leaders that were supposed to be in charge this starts to cause a problem within the whole of the of the republic who's really in charge is it caesar because he says he has he's the dictator and under the laws that they had for dictators, he obviously is the one in charge. He has even more power than the Senate, according to his dictatorship. And the Senate is saying, no, you can't just name yourself dictator. But Julius Caesar basically shows up with his armies every day and says, yeah, I'm kind of the dictator unless somebody wants a sword in their stomach. And the Senate begrudgingly says, fine, that will work. This starts a huge shift in our understanding of Rome. Now, you might ask why Caesar is so loved by the people. First off, he has a centralized military, their governance under personal control. Before, the armies of Rome were alleg had allegiance to Rome. They fought for Rome, the citizens and people of Rome, SPQR. Uh, Senatus Populus Quarantus Romanus, I think is what it is in Latin. And their banner they flew under was that they were fighting for Rome. But under Caesar, he was so well loved by his men and he was such a great general uh, they basically are only loyal to him. They don't really care who they have to kill or how they have to do it. They just know that Caesar's the man and we're sticking with him. Caesar also redistributes the land to war veterans and other allies. If you were one of the landless peasants who joined Caesar's army and you rose up to, say, I don't know, like a lieutenant or something, you probably got some land through this like civil war that Caesar started, and that's really cool. Maybe you weren't uh, down with the whole overthrowing the government stuff, but you kind of got what you wanted in the first place, was that your family had lost their land maybe generations ago, and you got your land back. Next, he set up major building projects to reduce urban unemployment. When you lose your farm, you move to the city to try and find work anyway and keep your family or yourself alive. Well, by Caesar setting up these building projects for Rome, he's setting up a jobs for people and these people are really thankful yeah it sucks lugging bricks everywhere and stones but it's better than starving to death in the streets he also extended citizenship to the provinces these people that were far away that were ruled by rome maybe weren't getting such a fair shake after the whole like uh republic system but under caesar he's giving citizenship out and those people are really happy to just let things slide because now they have this new cool like protection from rome now as you can see through these policies Caesar is basically crossing off, number one, the military threat. If you're the military or you're another private army, you're not going to go against a bunch of guys who are loyal to Caesar. He also is eliminating the threat of other lieutenants by giving them land. He's eliminating the threat of a popular uprising by the urban poor because they have jobs now. When you're working hard and you're really happy about not being dead, you're going to kind of like the guy who did that. And finally, he's eliminating the outside threat of getting re having Rome get attacked while he's getting things set up by extending citizenship. If That citizenship means nothing to you if you overthrow Rome, so you need to just keep things the way they are and don't attack Caesar. He sounds like he's got it all under control. Now here's the big problem. The aristocrats start to feel threatened 
and want to assassinate Caesar. They believe that his actions have basically destroyed the Republic. Now, it's debatable about their motives in saying, did they really feel so sad over the fact that they were losing their beloved Republic? Or were they more sad about the fact they were losing all their power and Caesar basically was in charge by himself? So if you were one of those landed, old school, many generation Senate members, well, you are going to be a little pissed off that some random young general shows up and says that he's in charge and you mean nothing anymore. Don't, doesn't he know that you've been in charge all this time? Well, the senators get together and they assassinate Caesar in 44 BCE. There's a famous picture of them all getting stabbed. Well, what happens immediately after is that the people, the senators go out and they say, look, we've killed Caesar, isn't this awesome? And the people are so sad, they're like, no, man, this is messed up. You shouldn't have killed him. He did all this good stuff for us. Well, there's a civil conflict that follows the death of Caesar, and it's basically between one of Caesar's generals and his adopted son, Augustus, or Gaius Octavianus. And uh, Mark Antony eventually runs away to Egypt, to join the last Ptolemy, Ptolemaic uh, queen known as Cleopatra, you know, the same Cleopatra you think about in, like the great beauties of the world or whatever. Well, Augustus or Octavius at this time basically has his armies try and kill all these people, and he eventually has this great battle and like beats Mark Antony, and Cleopatra lets herself get bitten by like an asp, which is like a snake, and they die. So now Augustus is free to reign by himself. And he actually uh, takes the title Augustus. And Augustus in Latin means like majestic or increaser or the venerable. This is a big shift. Not, not before this did any of the Romans actually say they were like gods. And under Augustus, he's basically calling himself the godlike, the majestic, the increaser, the venerable. The, the, it's like a religious title. It's like priest. And, or even, even more so, it's like, like half deity, half man. And uh, under Augustus, this is the start of what is known as the Roman Empire. And he is calling himself Augustus, and he'll be known as Caesar Augustus, or the great Caesar Augustus. And this starts in 27 BCE. Now, under Augustus, his administration uh, or governance shows up as this. It's a monarchy disguised, disguised as a republic. He says he's going to restore the republic. His his father had tried to help the Republic, and the senators killed him, so he's going to set the Republic back up again. But in reality, he just makes himself similarly like his father, a dictator, and he calls it, and it's basically a monarchy. He increased the centralization of political and military power. He brought even more power under himself. He even changed the way they started to do um, the army, how it was supposed to be set up. He stabilized the empire. He quelled all the rebellions that were going on. And he's going to die in 14 CE. He's going to actually like travel a very long time, being one of the longest reigning Caesars. Now, Suetonius is a writer during the time of uh, the empire. And what he's going to say is he's going to create this like history of the life of the Caesars. And this is a little primary source I wanted to kind of throw in there. And it says, Since the city was not adorned as the dignity of the empire demanded and was exposed to fire and flood, or flood and fire, he so beautified it that he could justly boast that he had found it built of brick and left it marble. He made it safe too for the future, so far as human foresight could provide for this. So under Augustus' administration, he had changed the way that Rome had looked. All the great things that we know about Rome, basically the, the architecture, the structures, these beautiful buildings began under Augustus. And he changed the, the main building material from brick to very expensive marble, trying to make Rome this like amazingly beautiful capital city. And Suetonius gives us that primary source to look at. Next, there's expansion and integration of empire. Uh, Romans start to expand and increase uh, their occupation in very remote empires. They actually make it all the way far north as like England and conquer most of England. They get stopped by like the Scots and the Irish up there. Uh, they spread all the way to the west into Spain and most of what we would now know as the Portuguese and the Portugal. Uh, they go all the way over to like Asia Minor, which is like Turkey today. And they go as far south as like most of Egypt and the like northern tip of like Africa, which is part of the Mediterranean. So they have a huge empire spread around. Uh, they cover Gaul, which is France. They talked about Germany, Britain, and Spain. It's amazing how far they were able to stretch. Next, they have the coordination of crop production and transport of natural resources. This is one of the great things about Rome that you really need to pay attention to. This coordination of crop production happens under 
uh, the empire system. In Greece, they were really well known for making grapes and olives. That's why Greek wine, for example, Greek olive oil, is grown there even to today. In Spain, their large open fields were known for growing wheat and grain. Over in uh, like France and Germany, they were really well known for like growing meat and animals. And they started to coordinate, instead of having each region grow its own thing for its own product, they started making things have to be integrated together. So for example, Spain, instead of trying to grow cows and trying to grow grain and olives and all these different things, they're going to make them focus on one really big important crop, which is grain. And they're going to have that grain from Spain <laughs> get spread all across the empire to feed all the people. Now in Greece, instead of having them grow grain and cows and oil for themselves, they're going to have the Greeks grow olives to make olive oil and take that olive oil and spread it all over the world. You can see how that spreading out and coordination of crop production to transport it across the whole of the empire helps make things more efficient and it simplifies things. As long as Rome controls those areas and keeps everybody transporting and trading, it keeps a lot of people fed and a lot of things moving. They develop this infrastructure and cities emerge. They're actually going to start to build roads, these amazing things called the Roman roads. I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. Look at how far on the map the Roman Empire expands. Libya uh, is modern day, Judea down to Jerusalem, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, Armenia, Macedon, all of Rome, Germany, Germania, Britain, Iberia, Gaul. Look at how big it's become. It's one of the largest empires of its time. Next, we're going to talk about the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. Between 27 and 250 CE, Rome was known for basically establishing a peace that had never really been seen in that part of the world for a very long time. Through the Roman peace, or at least the threat of basically you're going to get screwed or killed if you mess with Rome, they were able to facilitate trade and communication. Uh, they set up these great amazing roads as they talked about they put sand they dug ditches they put pavers they had gutters even along this road and along these roads they were able to travel hundreds of miles in a day if they really needed to and this also allowed people to know where they were going they weren't lost it allowed patrols to kind of guard sections of the road to make sure that nobody was like attacked or hurt on them this made it safer to trade made it safer for communication and along that road, they had, like I said, curbs, which allowed like up to two carts. These things were like 15 feet wide in some places, and they were allowing carts to go both ways, almost like a highway today. There's drainage. They allowed, instead of like puddles everywhere, which would ruin your cart and was kind of gross and could make you sick, it allowed the rocks that they had, the pavers, to actually like drain down and protect your goods and keep your cart from getting stuck. They had flat paving stones, so instead of bumping around and breaking your cartwheels, it was very nice. It had smooth like rocks, and things could go over them really well. They had milestones, so you knew how far you were going, or at least how far you needed to go until you got to the next town. And they even had postal services with like postal stations, where letters could travel across the empire really quickly because of runners. On the right is one of my favorite uh, scenes from a movie known as Life of Brian's. Uh, Brian, where it talks about uh, these group of guys who are sitting around trying to, compl they're complaining about the Romans, and they say, all right, apart from the sanitation, the medicine, the education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Kind of a funny joke when you think about how Rome and the Roman peace, or the Pax Romana that was set up, actually helped a bunch of people, even people who might not have even liked the Romans because they got all these awesome things in exchange. Here's an example of that Roman road. You can see how uh, deep those drainage ditches are. You can see there's like these crossing areas, those big raised stone in the middle. And then you have these curbs where people could stand out of the road and, and they could allow water to drain through there or sewage to go through there and keep it out of like the way of people. This provided for a more sanitary world and a cleaner world in general, which is pretty cool. Next up, we have the Roman laws. These are known as the 12 tables created in 449 BCE way back uh, these adapted to diverse populations of the Roman rule. They kind of tweaked and changed it as the poor got poor and the rich got richer. It worked to their advantage. And over time, as the poor got richer and the rich got poorer under Julius Caesar and the later Caesars, it was adapted once again. But one of the key provisions, one of two key provisions that it had was first, the right of being innocent until proven guilty. It is very hard to prove a negative. If I said you murdered somebody, it's very hard to prove you didn't murder somebody. 
Whereas if we automatically assume that you're innocent until we prove you have done something wrong, that puts the burden of proof on the accuser. And that makes our society that works a lot better and people are uh, more amenable and things just work out really well. They also set up this thing known as the right to challenge your accusers in court. If I say that you stole from somebody, well, I have to show up to court to say, yes, I saw that person steal from that other person. You have the right to know who is bringing accusations against you and to defend yourself. No longer is it this thing of you're under arrest. Why am I under arrest? Because somebody saw you do something bad. Well, who saw me do something bad? Well, we can't tell you. You're just going to jail forever. Under Roman law, that stuff couldn't happen anymore, which is really good and really amazing, which even something we keep to this day in America. Now there's commercial agriculture and trade. Again, with the latifundia, the production for export, uh, those large plantations we talked about before are no longer just for a uh, single person's profit. Now they're actually part of some of the empire. Yes, they were still making money, a lot of those people, but what ends up happening is they're able to make sure that they grow grain in the very specific areas or olives in very specific areas and make sure that that goes out to all the empire. And this production for export uh, allows for regional specialization. That's that whole like Greece making like olives and Spain making wheat and all that stuff. And this integration of an empire-wide economy gives jobs to lots of people over all the empire. We know from this famous primary source document called the Sailing Itinerary of the Red Sea that uh, they were traveling from as far as Asia Minor, like Turkey, all the way to Spain, and, some, and they're just bringing goods all over the place, transporting things, trading from one end to the other. This allows for goods to trade all over the world, or at least the known world at that time, at an amazingly fast rate in an abundance of quantity or quality and in the highest of quality. People are getting a lot of cool stuff, stuff they never thought they'd ever be able to see or even better quality stuff than they've seen in the past, all because of this network and commercial trade system. Next, the city of Rome starts off by having a, a big cash flow problem. They have taxes, they have tribute, and they have spoils and commerce, but they start to have massive construction under uh, of projects. They have statutory, monumental architecture, and aqueducts. These taxes are brought in by people being taxed, and like you know how taxes work. They also have tributes where it's like if you're a Providence, that's like Gaul, for example, you got to send money and some goods every na every so often, like once a year or once a month or whatever, to make sure that Rome stays happy. They have spoils from just jacking people and fighting their country and taking all their stuff. And then there's commerce. They just kind of take taxes off of people trading and buying things and things like that. Those massive construction projects, they built huge statues. There were hundreds, if not tens of thousands of statues in Rome at any given time. They built monumental architecture like the Colosseum and the Circus Maximus. And most importantly, they built aqueducts that brought fresh, clean water all over the empire. And they were able to do this through this amazing technology called concrete. Concrete was invented under the Romans, and it was a uh, quick setting, it was cheap, it was really easy to set pipes into place and to making sure it was very precise. If you're drilling into, say, like rock, and you're trying to get pipes to fit, well, you can kind of screw that up. Whereas if you make this liquid concrete, and you get the pipe set, and then you pour the concrete over it, you can protect the pipes, it can be safe, and everything will work out a lot better that way. Here's a little bit of an overview of like a, a Roman house. This is a very rich person's house, by the way. There's lots of little rooms, lots of like little designs, and it was an open air, open air, open floor plan model to try and keep things cool. Inside, you can see some frescoes that are part of like a very rich person's house again. And these frescoes would have been just decorations. You didn't have TV back then, so these were just nice things to look at, tell stories to your kids and stuff. Here's a garden. Romans were very famous for their gardens, sitting out in the air. It can be kind of warm in Italy, and though with no air conditioning, you got to kind of sit outside sometimes, maybe sleep outside, get some cool air on you. Now, next we have the Roman attractions. They had imported goods. They had an um, amazing number of just random foods coming from all over the world, and they also had imported alcohol and imported uh, like trinkets and blankets and books and information, all coming from around the world, and these imported goods were a benefit to the citizens of Rome because they felt like, hey, our empire's doing pretty good. We got a lot of cool stuff. They also had underground sewage. If there's one thing you guys know about me by now, it's that I love toilets. I love the fact that toilets exist, and underground sewage is a cornerstone of having toilets. If you don't have anywhere for the poop to go after you poop, you gotta make sure it goes into the sewage. That underground sewage made things more sanitary. It also kept the sewage from interacting with the drinking water, and that makes for a very healthy populace and keeps the smell and just everything from that's bad that's associated with sewage from being a big problem, which is why go Romans. 
they also had the Circus Maximus. It could hold uh, 250,000 spectators. It was for races, like chariot races. They would run around them, horse races. They also built the Coliseum. This is where they'd have gladiatorial games. Gladiatorial games, kind of awesome, kind of barbaric. Basically, people show up. Uh, gladiators, men, it's like big armor, would fight to the death, stab each other, cut each other up, and or, or fight wild animals like tigers and lions and stuff. And it was just seen as like kind of a thing to do. I mean, people watch boxing today and UFC, and I don't think that the gladiatorial games are that far off from what we do with those sorts of things. So something to think about. Family and society, the Potter Familius, the father of the family. Now, in the family system and the society of Rome, they had the head or the father of the family. He had the right to arrange marriages, sell his children into slavery. He had absolute right of ownership over his wife and over his children. Women were not allowed to inherit property. Uh, they This didn't really happen as much as it could have. Later in the empire, women were holding a lot of land, making a lot of decision. And even that whole thing of the Potter Familius, the right to arrange marriages and sell children, they, we have very few evidence or very little evidence of fathers actually just abusing this power and being so evil and tyrannical. Most of the time, the fathers were pretty good, but it's nice to know that like they had that power and that uh, this is kind of a radical way of like owning other people. Children don't have rights, and neither do women during this time, at least in the way the Romans saw it. There's wealth and social change. There's a newly rich that challenged the aristocracy. Originally, it was just the aristocracy and the plebeians, so the, the patricians and the plebeians. But then we move to... Uh, these merchant classes, as the empire expands and as it grows and as trade happens, there's a new rich uh, group of people that are saying, hey, why don't we get the same privileges you guys do? Why don't we get citizenship? All We have enough money as you. We even have better houses than you in some cases. And some of you are broke, yet you just have a name. That's not fair. We should be like better than you guys. And so there's some problems going on with them. Yet the poor is still increasing in size. The poor are getting bigger because more people are showing up and basically saying, hey, we're part of the empire too. There's no jobs. We need to make money and richer getting richer. And what's the deal? So the Romans, instead of really trying to have like social reform or trying to figure out how to better distribute taxes or maybe like redistribute the wealth a little, they decide for the option of penum and circuses. It's Latin for bread and circuses. They believe that as long as they give out bread to the poor people, basically show up every day at this line, the government of Rome will give you bread. And as long as they put on some cool, like, spectator things, like gladiatorial games and uh, giant, like, I don't know, chariot races, everyone's going to be kind of happy. Just keep them distracted. Keep them distracted. Don't let them feel, like, sad about that they're all, like, poor and stuff. And it works for a little bit. Now, the issue of slavery is one that's kind of interesting when it comes to Rome. During the 2nd century CE, it's estimated that one-third of the empire's population was a slave. This is huge, if you think about it the the majority of rome was worked by slaves and when you have a slave population you're gonna have a, a kind of pushback customarily there was manumission or freedom of slaves at the age of 30 that was like a custom it was no law ever written about them many of them did agricultural work working in fields they did dug through quarries and in mines they were on chain labor meaning they were chained together and and it depends on who you ask. Most slave owners were probably pretty good. They even afforded some of their um, their slaves uh, a lot of privileges. One of the best Stoics we know about was like a preacher for Stoicism, and he was a slave. Uh, but, you know, if you were a slave and you didn't like it, maybe you would revolt. And the biggest revolt we know of was under Spartacus in 73 BCE. Spartacus led a giant rebellion. He eventually gets squashed, but he, he gets a bunch of groups of slaves to kind of join him, and they get swords, and they... Uh, are have to be put down by a very large Roman legion. And this starts to kind of show up on the Romans' radar as, hey, this this is crazy. We need to figure out a new way to relate to our uh, our community and our, co and our country as a whole. There's Roman deities. Mostly the Romans were polytheistic. None, none of them really believed in just, like, one god. They had major gods. Like, for example, they had Jupiter, who would be, like, Zeus. They borrowed a lot from other cultures. And they had, like, Mars, the god of war, and Neptune, and just, like, a bunch of different gods. And, and all of them did different things. Like, for example, Mars was the god of war, uh, Jupiter, the god of, like, all the gods. And you get the idea. It's, it's just a bunch of gods doing some stuff. But mostly the way the Romans looked at the world through the gods was that the gods were just like humans, except for way, like, weirder and way more, like, pervy. 
uh, the gods, if you read some of the like classical mythology, were just like running around sleeping with everybody, or like tr basically tricking humans into sleeping with them all the time, or they were just pulling like really mean tricks on humans. And the gods like were petty and jealous, and they fought each other all the time, and some of them like eat their own babies. It's just like really crazy. And so these major Roman deities were just kind of like a source of entertainment as well as a source of like prayers. They had uh, the Romans basically had tutelary or guardian deities as well. Like they had uh, like one example is they had a god of the threshold. So they had a god who was like supposed to protect the things that come into your house. Like think of like a god dream catcher. So in, like the way that you protected bad things from coming in your house, like miscarriages or like falling down the stairs or something, was you prayed to your tutelary or guardian deity to protect your house. The Romans were also really good at absorbing gods from other cultures. The Romans weren't so stuck up to believe that like their god was like the one god or the, their gods were like the gods. They believed like, hey, we conquered your land. Your god is like Bapa da Boopy. I guess Bapa da Boopy is a pretty cool god. Why don't we just like buy in with him? Sounds good to me. And so they would just add him to what was known as the Pantheon or the giant hall of gods. Next up, we have uh, Cicero and Stoicism. Marcus Tertullius Cicero, 106 to 43 BCE. Major order, writer, he's influenced a lot by Greek thought. Now, Stoicism has a lot to do with like logic and reason. Stoic means to be someone who's not moved by like emotion or moved by like kind of fickle things like emotions, obviously, or your feelings. And he believed that like the best way to live life is to be living it through logic, through reason. And he promoted he promoted Stoicism basically to kind of give us a way of understanding how we should do things and how we should live our lives and stoicism is a way to live your life if you want to live by logic and reason he's he's a pretty good person to kind of look to as like what you should do and and, and it starts to become a very big movement within uh rome because the romans really like logic and reason and they really like the greeks next up we have mithraism it's another like religion it comes from the zoroastrian myth the god of sun and light mithros he uh sacrifices a bull but Mithros is uh, not really focused on a lot for his uh, like light and sun. He's more focused um, in the Roman version on strength, courage, and discipline. He's like a, a soldier's god. He's really good at like having virtues that you like, kind of discipline yourself and follow your leaders and have a lot of courage in battle. Be strong as a man. He kind of gave people like a way to like look at their world and and try and like follow a set of principles. Now, women were not admitted into this cult, the Mithras, the Mithras, Mithraism cult, and uh, as a result, uh, this is appealing mostly to military, like I said, so instead, the women kind of uh, bind a lot to the cult of Isis, who's very popular, she's uh, an Egyptian goddess, uh, but she's pictured here. She's uh, known for a lot of the similar qualities, but uh, she's very popular because she gives women kind of this uh, way of integrating into religion. Women are not always seen as being valuable, but in under the cult of Isis, women are seen as valuable. This is going to come into play a lot under Christianity because uh, women are going to find their place within uh, religion as being important. Now we're going to kind of transition a little bit to some stuff that's happening around Rome and look at uh, Judaism in early Rome. Uh, Judaism, or uh, the Jewish people, had uh, established themselves in what we would now call like Israel Palestine area today uh, Jewish monotheism is basically at odds with most ancient cultures number one because the Jews believed that there was one God his name was Yahweh and that he basically did everything he created the Sun the moon the stars the earth people everything we see everything we don't see God made and he's like super awesome in their minds because he's it there is all those other gods that people talk about aren't real they're just statues and they don't exist and god is uh, yahweh is the only real god now if you're a roman or any other culture you're basically going to say no that that's wrong we have isis we have mithras we have jupiter we have all those other guys like how can you say they don't exist that's crazy but the jewish were like very fervent about this and they even built a temple seen here uh well like a re-envisioning of that temple uh which sat in the middle of jerusalem they also, the Jews, refused to recognize state gods. Uh, at, in the later parts of the empire, the Romans started to worship the Caesars as gods. Like, their belief was that, obviously, since they had set themselves up to be Caesars, they must have some sort of, like, divine power. Or maybe they had some sort of, like, uh, divine spark within them. And as a result, they must be pretty godlike. So you should worship them. Well, the Jews refused to do that. And also, uh, they also, the Romans actually built in Jerusalem 
right near this temple, the Fortress of Antonia. And the Fortress of Antonia was this giant Roman barracks, basically, and it oversaw the Roman temple, which the Jews really prized because they believed that in that giant like square box part in the middle, God had placed his ark. And the ark was this like special box that like peop- that God had made through the direction uh, by the direction of God through the people, and inside of it held like the Ten Commandments, and God actually resided in that temple. And if you, they even believed if you went in that temple, you would like die because it was such a holy and special place. Now, if you're Jewish, you're not gonna like the fact that that giant fortress is just like overlooking your temple and like you're kind of dominating over them. The Romans finally crush the Jewish self-governance in the Jewish war between 66 and 70, and they actually kill the last uh, rebellious Jews at the giant uh, fortress built by a man named Herod, one of the former governors of the area, and uh, that giant fortress was known as Masada. Here's a synagogue at Capernaum, a Roman uh, city which was dominated by Romans, but they still had a synagogue or a Jewish place of worship. So the Romans were very accepting of the Jews, even though they thought they were a little crazy because they believed only like one God, and the Jews didn't really like and kind of resented the fact that the Romans were over them. Now at the same time, out in the middle of the desert, there was this group called the Essenes. They were a messianic, or they believed that some guy was going to show up and like get rid of the Romans and fix everything, and they were a Jewish cult. They believed in baptism, or ritual washing where they would go to like rivers and dunk themselves and believe that like through this like cleansing and washing they were cleansing themselves of sin and impurity they lived an ascetic lifestyle they basically like rose every day with the sun believing that god would send his messianic or like great redeemer and sunrise and if he didn't show up that day well they'd go about their business living in the desert and one of the really important things that the essenes did is they wrote what was known as the dead sea scrolls now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very important to human history because uh, for a very long time, people didn't believe that the Bible could be verified beyond a couple hundred years after the year zero because the earliest surviving transcripts we have come from only a couple hundred years after um, this time. And so what they believed was that, hey, maybe people just like backfilled or made up all this information about like King David and and Solomon and Moses and Abraham and all this stuff and they kind of just like made it all up after the fact to kind of coincide with everything. Now with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls we're able to carbon date or at least move back that date of how old some of these texts are like for example the book of Ezekiel we can move it back to the BCE era and that gives a lot of credibility to some of the like religious um, underpinnings of what uh, the Essenes and some of the Jews were talking about. Now we're going to talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was a a Jewish teacher or a rabbi. The stories that we have of him come from the New Testament and some outside sources like Josephus, a famous like Jewish historian. He argues that there was this man named Jesus wandering around. He taught a moral code kind of culminating in his Sermon on the Mount. You probably heard it before like blessed are the poor in spirit, yada yada yada. Uh, He had a reputation for miracle working like he healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind he made the lame walk or people who couldn't walk walk and uh, the romans started to fear instigation of rebellion this all culminated in one of jesus's teaching where uh, the jews as i talked about before really didn't like the fact that the romans were basically over them and the jews had a long history of getting rid of people who tried to rule over them well one day jesus is teaching and somebody asked him rabbi uh should we pay taxes to caesar Now this is kind of a double-edged question because if Jesus were to say, yes, of course you should pay your taxes to Caesar, aren't the Romans in charge? Well, the Jews would have said, screw you, man. You know, we don't want to pay no taxes to to Caesar. You're not like a real rabbi. You're not a real like Jew. You're not even our Messiah. Like, man, you're not even like trying to help us out. All you want to do is like get along to get along. That's not who we need. But at the same time, if Jesus would have said, no, don't pay your taxes to Caesar, that would have been seen as open rebellion of the Roman authority and the Romans would have had to do something at that point because he's basically telling the Jews like yeah screw the Romans we're gonna like take it back anyway so don't pay them well the Rome Jesus makes this kind of cool story where he says you know who give me a coin whose face is on the coin Caesar's face in the coin we'll give to Caesar what is Caesar's give to God what is God's Jesus tried to explain that uh, you should give your taxes or the money stuff to the to the Caesars or the Romans and give out back all their stuff, but give, you know, to God was God, like honor, worship, all that stuff. Well, the Romans begin to fear 
uh, that he might incite a rebellion, so they decide to crucify Jesus. They nail him to a big cross, and for those of you that are Christian, you've seen that before. It looks like a giant lowercase t, and they pin him up there. Now, Jesus' early followers believed in Jesus' resurrection, or the fact that once he died on that cross, three days later, he rose again from the dead, and then he began teaching and showing himself to people as alive. He, like, conquered death. The early followers of Jesus also believed in his divine nature, that, like, not only did he teach a really good code of, like, ethics, but also that he was, like, maybe part God or maybe all God. They were go they're going to work that out later on in, like, human history, but for that early days, they believed at least he was really, really special. So they start to affix the title of Christ, which means anointed one or God's anointed one. And they believe that Jesus, the Christ, uh, had come to like free people from their sin and to teach people the new way that God wanted them to like live in the world. And all of his teachings are recorded in what we now know as the New Testament or like the second half of the Bible. And uh, he's going to get uh, some important followers later on, which we'll talk about. Next up, we have Saul or Paul of Tarsus. He extends the teachings far beyond Jewish circles. Uh, Paul, who is the later incarnation of Saul, uh, argues that Jesus' message is actually like meant to be larger than we thought it was before, that it actually was a new way of like refixing how the Jews understood the world, that Yahweh, or God, really wanted them to live like Jesus said, not like all the old stuff said. So originally Saul was a hardcore like Jewish, like, rabbi slash teacher and uh, he was going around persecuting the Christians because he believed that anything that took away from Yahweh was like really bad. Then he goes on this road to Damascus and in the story Paul f falls from his horse and he is uh, shown Jesus or Jesus like talks to him and says why are you persecuting me and eventually Paul will like learn what Jesus was teaching about and he will believe that God wanted Paul to bring not just the message of Jesus to the Jewish community, but actually expand it out to like all of the Roman world. And so Paul and a couple of his friends travel widely throughout the Roman Empire, spreading the gospel or the good news of Jesus all throughout the Roman Empire, converting people along the way. This is known as missionary activity, where he's sharing the news of Jesus and he's making arguments. And a lot of his letters to different churches or groups that follow Jesus are saved and put into what we now know as the New Testament. Then we have early Christian communities. These local leaders were known as bishops. Uh, they were in charge of like smaller things called churches or ecclesias at the time. And these were place groups of communities that worshipped Jesus as either the Son of God or as God himself. And this leads to regional variation in doctrine and ritual. Women in some circles are accepted and allowed to be having important roles in the churches or the ecclesias. In some groups, uh, still Christian, they believe that no, women shouldn't be in charge and that men should be in charge. Some groups believe that Jesus was divine. He was all God and like God came to earth through Jesus and like lived a life and then he died and God like died for their sins. Some groups believe that Jesus was just a really good man and God like blessed him with like special powers and stuff. So this regional variation, depending on where you were, kind of changed how they did certain things, what they believed. And they are also argue, like, how did Jesus come back from the dead? Did he come back as, like, Jesus, Jesus? Or did he come back as, like, an angel? Like, what's the whole deal with that? And so this uh, gradually leads to um, a bunch of different groups right after the group death of Jesus. And they're trying to figure out, what does it all mean? Eventually, they're going to decide on a core set of texts. And this core set of texts are going to fall into what we now know as the New Testament. And then we have the growth of early Christianity. First off, they have Roman persecution. The Romans start to feel that this group of cr kind of crazy people are saying that their, their rabbi died, and he taught them how to live their lives and how everyone should live their lives, and it was the best way, and that God, the real God, was up there telling everyone how to live, and he sent his son to die for them and to teach them, and that the Romans needed to listen to Jesus and follow his rules and all his stuff, and the Romans get a little pissed off about this because the Jews start to say, or at least the Jews that are following Jesus and the Christians, that there is no king but God, and that Jesus was God himself. And so the Romans are going to get really pissed off about this. They have actually a modified version of the gladiatorial games. Instead of having the gladiators fight each other to the death, they would sometimes just bring out a bunch of Christians and allow gladiators to stab and chop them and make them into little pieces and fight them, while the Christians had no weapons. Many Christians actually went to their death as martyrs, which means people who are willing to die for their beliefs. 
and uh, many of them accepted death very willingly and wanted to become martyrs because they believed that their death would like promote the message of Jesus in a very radical way. Through this, there was a dramatic expansion of Christianity. People started to believe in Christianity a lot. Especially, Christianity uh, finds its place within the dispossessed and disenfranchised classes. If you don't have a lot, and you start to hear this message of a man who says that the kingdom of God is coming one day, and that one day everything is going to be made new, and every injustice that's ever happened will be fixed, and every bad thing that's ever been done will be corrected, and all the tears will be wiped away, and everything will be made new. You're going to start to like really like this message because it's talking about you. All the times you've lost your land, Jesus is going to fix that. All the times you've been like hurt or beaten up or had things attacked on you, uh, Jesus is going to fix that. And so the urban poor, people with nothing, and women especially who have no rights in a lot of the Roman communities, they're going to buy into this message. Now as a little side note, I read this book in college, pretty interesting, called The Rise of Christianity. He was a, uh, uh, written by Rodney Stark. He was a sociologist. And he's going to argue that uh, the reason Christianity rose so much was basically because of four reasons. Number one, there's an inclusion of women. Women are allowed to have rights. And actually in Christianity, there's, an, there's a ban on infanticide, which is like killing babies, because many Romans didn't believe you were a, a human being until you had at least like talking skills or reason skills. And they also have a ban on abortion because they believe that uh, God had put people in mothers and as a result of God doing that you can't destroy what God has set up that's like bad so women get a lot of rights through this Christian faith Stark also argues that disease there was a large plague that happened really soon after uh, Jesus was alive about a hundred years and uh, this disease wiped out a large uh, group of Romans and it spread people away from the cities because the plague obviously we know how germs work and um, contagions work spread throughout the urban poor and uh, they started to kill a large number of people now if you're a Christian and your main job as Jesus put it was to like heal the sick and to pray for those who are like hurting you would probably stay behind and try and help people now we know from modern day that the buildup of antibodies in one's system will help protect them from diseases but it back in the day when, during the Roman times you didn't know what antibodies were so if you saw people like helping you and you're dying of the plague and maybe they kept you alive because you got like some water and some clean like clothes and stuff and you didn't die and they didn't die you must think like wow this Jesus guy or this like Christian religion probably is really important it's like helping everybody out so maybe I should become one of those uh, Christianity also explained evil as evil wasn't this like crazy thing that just randomly happened but more like God wanted good things to happen to people and that like if you follow God good things will happen it also allowed those people who were willing to stay behind to spread their ministry and to share their gospel of Jesus with those people. Stark then argues that social cohesion, if you lost your family through these plagues or like just random happenstance, you found a new family or like social group through Christianity. The church of Jesus argues that everybody is brother and sister, and a lot of the texts of early Christianity refer to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And if you don't know where to belong, well, Christianity is a pretty cool place to kind of belong because you kind of integrate yourself into a new family. Maybe you don't like your family. Maybe you don't really get along with your family. Well, Christianity allowed for you to find a whole new group to be along, get along with. And finally, martyrdom. Stark argues that when you're willing to die for your beliefs, you add a lot of credibility to your testimony. Many of you could probably think of some things that you'd be willing to die for. Maybe you'd, somebody came to your house and was like, I'm going to shoot you and your whole family. Uh, you might be willing to die for your family. You might be willing to die for, like, your friends, but if you're willing to die for your ideas, that you believe that this guy named Jesus came to earth, died on a cross, rose again, and, like, died for your sins, and you're willing to die for that, you know, people are going to take notice. I don't think there's a lot of things in this world I'd be willing to die for, and it's going to lead to a lot of people converting because they're going to see, hey, maybe this is important. Now, after a long bit of lecture, we have finally reached the end. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. So, explain Rome's development from a small city-state with a king to a republic. Go ahead and draw a little timeline, kind of write out some of the changes that happened. Explain the constitution of the Roman Republic and its expansion into a preeminent power in the Mediterranean. How did the uh, Roman constitution set up its republic, and how did that republic eventually become a giant power in the Mediterranean? What major events happened? Maybe something with Carthage. 
Describe the transformation of Rome from a republic to an empire from the Gracchi brothers to Augustus. Another timeline, kind of what happened in there. Next, assess the impact of continuing expansion and integration of the empire into lands around the Mediterranean. Make sure you ex understand why they're expanding, how they're expanding, like what were the two ways they expanded, and how did they integrate the lands around them into like part of their society. Next, explain the expansion of trade and urbanization in the Mo Roman Mediterranean and the impact upon society. As they traded, what was happening to cities? What was happening to the Roman Empire as a whole? Next, explain the significant features of family and social values in Roman times. What made the Roman times so special about family? And what did they value in the Roman society? Next, understand the influence of Greek philosophy and the religions of salvation upon the Roman world. How did those two religions or three religions, Stoicism, Mithraism, and the cult of Isis, kind of feed a little bit into Christianity and how do they all kind of relate to one another and how do they overlap? Maybe a little bit of a Venn diagram kind of system going on there. And finally, outline the experiences of Judaism and early Christianity in the Roman Empire. Make a T-chart, what happened in Judaism in the Roman Empire and what happened in early Christianity in the Roman Empire. Here's our writing assignment, five day short response sentences. Number one, how were the Romans so successful in conquering and holding such a vast territory? couple different reasons there that's a good discussion we're gonna have number two why did Christianity spread so much more rapidly than other religions of salvation what were some of the key factors that made Christianity so appealing to so many and number three the book refers to Augustus government as a monarchy disguised as a republic what does this phrase mean does this disguise to continue throughout the Empire period look at some of the other examples of the later Caesars and a little bit what we talked about why does the Republic's title still remain, yet the monarchy is kind of the method that the book is talking about. As always, after a long lecture, it's time to reread. I know, take a little break, go get yourself a Coke Zero or something, and a, I don't know, a Kit Kat, and uh, go ahead and reread that chapter. I will see you soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.